Folks, I have survived a lot of events while I've been on the air. Shenanigans of Sheik Nordine. I said you had sex with Jay Richardson. You know what I'm talking about. You're undercover, homosexual. Sal Johnny. You're slandering the man. You know what's Wanna really debate? good, girlfriend. I brought the money, son. I brought the money, son. Wow. I brought the money. When you want to debate me? Egotistical Eggleston. You is more than a dog. You more than a dog. You worse than a dog. William Lewis Eggleston told you that. Now get the coat, and then I'll get up and get me a good lawyer and tell what you did to me. I wonder if I can survive a time change. My new time on Sunday night, 9 p.m. Folks, I have survived a lot of events while I've been on the air. Shenanigans of Sheik Nordine. I said you had sex with Jay Richardson. You know what I'm talking about. You're undercover, homosexual. Sal Johnny, you're slandering the man. You know what's Wanna really debate? good, girlfriend. I brought the money, son. I brought the money, son. Wow. I brought the money. When you want to debate me? Egotistical Eggleston. You is more than a dog. You more than a dog. You worse than a dog. William Lewis Eggleston told you that. Now get the coat, and then I'll get up and get me a good lawyer and tell what you did to me. I wonder if I can survive a time change. My new time on Sunday night, 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Jim's over here with you. And as always, we want to give our content information so you can reach us in the event you would like to study God's Word with us or you'd like to meet with us and assemble with us and study God's Word with our meeting times. We meet at 250 the Boulevard there in Eden, North Carolina, 276-340-2653 or 336-394. 5721. If you would like to uh, call me or you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com and uh, we'll be glad to uh, study the Bible with you or, or assist you in any way we can. That's, that's what we're here for. We appreciate you watching a word from the Lord as well as what does the Bible say? Uh, what does the Bible say brought to you by the Church of Christ that meet in uh, Martinsville and Danville? 823 Starting Avenue in Martinsville. There's Johnny's Information, 276-806-2150. Uh, Martin Menace is at um, Danville, 120 American Legion there in Danville, 434-770-8412. Uh, and I uh, hope that you will uh, go out and visit with these brethren and uh, study the Bible with them and just examine the Church of Christ. You know, we're constantly telling people we want you to come and, and see what we are all about examine what the Bible is saying, examine what we're teaching, and we want to give you that opportunity to do that very thing. So I hope that you will uh, make yourself uh, uh, available to that. Be ready. Also, go ahead and start plugging this Our in uh, June, uh, which is just uh, just a month away, um, almost a month to the day, I guess, isn't it? Uh, June, what is it? The June the 17th uh, is the tent meeting that will be in Martinsville. Yes, June 17th. Uh, it's going to be in Martinsville where it was uh, last year, my understanding is. They're on the corner of Fett and, and uh, uh, I'm not sure the, the streets there, Church Street or Fett Street and somewhere, somewhere out there. If you know where it was last year, it's going to be in the same place, right there in the middle of Martinsville. So I uh, hope you'll come out and and be with that. So here we are, uh, just a month away, and uh, so start making plans for that. Start making plans for that. If you're wanting more Bible teaching, watch uh, what does the Bible say on on uh, whigtv.com. That's on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. That's coming out of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Brother Johnny Robertson uh, is is broadcasting down there on uh, Tuesday nights, and so we hope that you will. Um, Take advantage of that and watch that. You know, friends, what this sh shows is that we are, we're not content to stay right here in this area. We believe the gospel is the power of God to save, Romans 1, 16. And we're not ashamed of it, and we want to, we want to preach it and teach it. And as we've been doing on a regular basis um, from uh, this venue, from the one in Martinsville, from the, here in Reedsville, uh, we want to continue doing that anywhere we can. We are in the process of working uh, uh, to get uh, some radio broadcast up as well. And so uh, uh, we are multiplying, we are increasing, we're ever trying to extend the borders of the kingdom. And so those of you who think that we're doing the kingdom a disservice, uh, we appreciate your efforts to try to stop us because all that does is make us more content more, or more determined to uh, uh, 
uh, uh, to spread the gospel and shows that uh, uh, the truth will always prevail. And so we are, uh, you know, we're determined to see that through. Also, those of you who, who love the program and want to see more of it, those of you watching out in in uh, Oklahoma, Texas, and various and sundry places, we appreciate your your watching, knowing that you're watching online and you're getting this program uh, as a result of your love for the truth and you're willing to take the time to, to watch it. We appreciate you watching and uh, your prayers for our on our behalf. I posted on Facebook this uh, this afternoon that there was going to be a big announcement. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have been coming out of the closet lately. And... Uh, there's been a lot of things that have been said and, and done in the news, you know, to try to make people who have come out of the closet uh, more comfortable. There's been a lot of encouragement and applause and, and congratulations and uh, statements of how brave you are to come out of the closet. So I, you know, I, I just I thought, well, you know what, we need to do a lesson on coming out of the closet. Uh, one of the probably most recent things about coming out of the closet is uh, in regard to a, a man named Jason Collins. Jason Collins was a, is, is an NBA player who uh, recently has come out as being a homosexual. And uh, I try not to use the word gay. I, I know I have gay up on the screen, but there's really nothing gay about it. It's homosexual. And, uh, you know, he's come out of the closet, and a lot of things have been said about coming out of the closet or coming out and, and telling everyone that you're gay and, you know, when a person comes out, I start to realize that, you know, you can't say anything about that person. You can't say anything negative about that person. You can't uh, uh, give an opinion to, to the contrary when a person comes out uh, because that means that you're a, a bigot or you're a racist or you're a homophobe or, you know, you, you have some sort of um, uh, problem yourself if you oppose these sort of things. And so... Really, the only thing that can be said about people who come out of the closet is, uh, you know, congratulations or how brave you are or it's a great thing and look how what a wonderful world we're living in and that sort of thing. So that's really what happens when, when people come out. When people come out, that's what, that's what happens. But if you do say something contrary, then you are the one who's going to get the flack. You're going to get the, you're going to get the, the talking down to the scolding. For, as a matter of fact, Consider this, after Jason Collins came out and let everyone know that he was a homosexual, Chris Broussard, who is a, an, analyst, an, an, an analyst, a journalist for, the, uh, uh, for ESPN, he made these statements about, about uh, uh, Jason and basically saying that he disagreed, and I'm going to play this if I can, and let you let you listen to what Chris said, and uh, just to show you that uh, it is. Can we drop that banner just uh, for a moment there, Matt? Uh, just to show you how 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 people are against anything that that is negative. I'm gonna try to get down here to try to uh, play this uh, video. Now, this is Chris Broussard, who is commenting on Jason Collins coming out as a homosexual. Any audio there? I've played on basketball teams together for several years. We've gone out, had lunch together. We've had good conversations, good laughs together. He knows where I stand. Yeah. You know, criticize him. He doesn't criticize me and call me a bigot, call me ignorant, call me intolerant. And now I, I, I hear and, and talk I don't to hear people it. around the league, there are a lot of Christians in the NBA. And they don't want to be just because... Is, can you get any audio? Bad, I can't hear it all in here. They don't want to be viewed and called bigoted and intolerant and things like that. And that's where... All right, let's try this again. I, I know that's... Uh, I may tolerate someone whose lifestyle I disagree with. He can tolerate me, my beliefs, and he disagrees with my beliefs and my lifestyle. But true tolerance and acceptance is being able to handle that in, with as mature adults and not criticize. I don't agree with homosexuality. I don't agree with homosexuality. I think it's a sin. 
as I think all sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is. And LZ knows that. He and I have played on basketball teams together for several years. We've gone out, had lunch together. We've had good conversations, good laughs together. He knows where I stand, and I know where he stands. I don't, you know, criticize him. He doesn't criticize me and call me a bigot, call me ignorant, call me intolerant. And that I, I, I hear, and talking to some people around the league, there are a lot of Christians in the NBA. And they don't want to be, just because they disagree with that lifestyle, they don't want to be viewed and called bigoted and intolerant and things like that. And that's what LZ was getting at. Uh, just like I may tolerate someone whose lifestyle I disagree with, he can tolerate me, my beliefs and he disagrees with my beliefs and my lifestyle. But true tolerance and acceptance is being able to handle that in, with, with, as mature adults and not criticize each other and call each other names. Personally, I, I don't believe that you can live an openly homosexual lifestyle or an openly pre, like premarital sex between heterosexuals. If you're openly living that type of lifestyle, then the Bible says you know them by their fruits. It says that, you know, that's a sin. And if you're openly living in unrepentant sin, whatever it may be, not just homosexuality, adultery, fornication, premarital sex between heterosexuals, whatever it may be, I believe that's walking in open rebellion to God and to Jesus Christ. So I would not characterize that person as a Christian because I don't think the Bible would characterize him as a Christian. Now, those are some pretty judgmental statements by Chris Broussard. Now, he was coming out. He's saying he's a, he's a Christian, and uh, he doesn't think that someone who is uh, living a homosexual lifestyle is, uh, it can be a Christian, that they're living an open rebellion to God. And, uh, and I agree with him. I agree with him. But when he said that, when he said that, and a lot of people understood this was going to happen, when he said that, you knew that the hammer was going to come down on him. You knew that somebody somewhere was going to tell him he needed to back it down, walk it back, something, because you just can't say anything negative about people who come out. And sure enough, sure enough, here's what the uh, president of ESPN, John Skipper, said. He said, I think we did a great uh, I think we did great other than we made one mistake. The mistake was not being more careful with Chris Brassard. And there is a collective responsibility there. Chris Brassard's job was to come on and talk about the news of the league, how the league was representing it, and through a series of events he made personal comments, which was a mistake. Well, if you listen to that whole section, their own outside the lines, which was the program it was on, they began talking about, you know, how do you feel about this? And, and it, you know, I just don't see how anybody can say how do you feel about it without getting some personal uh, uh, feelings about it. I and mean, if I ask Mark, said, you know, how do you feel about something, Mark? And he tells me how he feels. I can't get mad when then he tells me how he feels. So, you know, excuse me for, for taking you at your word. If you say something, then I'm going to tell you something. So here's Chris Broussard stating how, how, what he believes, and he went through the whole spiel about the guy he was talking to there on the, on the set with him, L.Z. Uh, Grunderson, I think it was. He was a, he's an, he's an, a homosexual, too, and he said, we, look, we've had back and forth discussions all along about this, and he said, we don't, we don't call each other bigots and racists and homophobes or whatever. He said, but we have an intellectual discussion about it. We're tolerant in, from that standpoint. But it seems that the minute you say something out negative about someone who's living these alternative lifestyles, all of a sudden, you, you know, you're the bad guy. You're the bad guy. And so I, I'm, I'm learning a lesson. I'm watching this. Because when people, when people come out, when they come out of the closet, now all of a sudden they're the bad person. And so what society's trying to get people to do is, you know what, you need to, you need to be willing to come out. You don't need to be afraid or ashamed to come out of the closet. You need to be glad that you are the way you are and who you are. And so you don't need to be afraid, but, but still I think many people are afraid to come out lest they be ridiculed, lest they be condemned, lest they be ostracized and looked down upon. You know, 
Uh, so, so I'm learning something about coming out. And I'm learning this lesson, and so I'm telling you tonight, friends, I I'm coming out. Now, not the way you might think. Now, somebody's going to take this, Martin, they're going to make a good clip out of it. But, but listen, when I say I'm coming out, I want you to realize I'm taking advantage of this idea, this notion, that you can't talk about someone who comes out. You can't say something negative about someone who comes out. Now, I know that's the, that's the mentality because look at this. In John chapter 2, excuse me, John chapter 3, there was a man named Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a man, the Bible says, a man of the Pharisees. Now, Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that our teacher come from God, for uh, no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So Nicodemus is coming to Jesus by night. Now, why he came at night, I don't know. But I suspect, I suspect because I know how the Pharisees treated people who, quote, unquote, came out in support of Jesus. I know how they treated them. Oh, boy, you talk about being judgmental. You talk about being harsh. You talk about ostracizing. You talk about being the kind of people that, that uh, uh, would be judgmental and harsh and and, uh, and hateful to people. That was what the Pharisees were. I suspect Nicodemus knew this, and that's why he wasn't coming out. He was, he was tiptoeing out, you might say. Because notice this. In John chapter 7 and verse 48, Nicodemus, he kind of tiptoes out. In John chapter 7 and verse 48, now I say he tiptoes out because he comes to the defense of Jesus in a very subtle, roundabout way. Now, the, the, they're, being, they're discussing Jesus, and here's what they say. They say, have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Now, Nicodemus was one of them. Nicodemus was one of them, and, but the Pharisees, they're all they're getting there and said, have any, of the, have any of the Pharisees or the rulers believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. So basically they're saying, if you follow Jesus, you're cursed. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I can see why Nicodemus wouldn't come out with that. I can see why, why he wouldn't come out. He's being, he's being uh, 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 shocked or he's being uh, uh, intimidated, if you will. He's being intimidated not to come out. But notice this. But Nic and Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Now listen, all his peers, boy, I tell you what, man, they are, they are, are, uh, uh, they're, they don't like Christ. You know, they don't, they don't like these people that come up with this alternative religion, see? They don't, they don't like people that are going against the norm here. So, boy, I'll tell you what, if you came out, if you came out in favor of Jesus, you were out. Now, there's a number of places. John 12, John 12, they would keep people out of the, out of the synagogue. You couldn't, you couldn't come in. If you, if you came out, you couldn't come in. So Nicodemus says, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he hath done? Now watch how they treated him. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Are you one of him? Are you one of those followers of Jesus? He says, Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, and every man went to his own house. So that kind of ended that discussion right then. I tell you what, if they were if they were really scrutinizing, they could say, you know, Nicodemus, I think you may be kind of, you know, borderline. You may be kind of waffling on following Jesus or not. Now, I can see why someone might be intimidated and not coming out. But Nicodemus, so Nicodemus, he tiptoed out. But now here's another person in in uh, Acts, or excuse me, Matthew chapter twenty-five. Look at this in Matthew chapter twenty-five. You find uh, Peter. Now, Peter is one of these individuals, too, that uh, doesn't want to come out. He's, he's, he's afraid. He's embarrassed. He's a, maybe ashamed a little bit about coming out. How do I know that? Because look at this. In Matthew 25 and verse 69, Matthew 25 and verse 69,
Maybe I'll get this way. All right. I would like for, I'd make a request that we get a monitor back over here. So we don't have to look across the room here. Seriously? Can't believe this. All right. Yeah, but. For some reason it's not coming back over there. Oh, we might do it the old fashioned way here. I, I know what it is, Mark. It's not Matthew 25. That's the problem. What is it? Matthew 26, 69. Now, some of our religious neighbors, well, what, what difference is the number, you know? Well, that's close enough. No. Matthew 26, 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus Galilee. Then he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. Now see, he, he, he doesn't want, want to come out of the closet here. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Verse 43, And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crowed, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. So here's Peter. He does not want to admit, he does not want to admit that he is a follower of Christ. He's, he's, he's out there in the closet. But I want you to notice something about Peter. Peter, Peter had a change of heart. Peter decided, you know what, we need to come out. I need to come out of the closet. And that's exactly what he does. In Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 4 and verse uh, 18, look at this. Now they're questioning them on healing this lame man. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right uh, in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye. Oh, Peter, don't you know that you're not supposed to judge? No, see, when you come out of the closet, you don't care if people judge you. You don't care. Because you're saying, look, I am not ashamed of what I believe. Peter said, look, I'm out of the closet now. You can judge me. He says, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. All right? Then in Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 5 and verse 27, here's Peter again. And when they had brought them, the apostles, and set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Men, the God of our fathers raised Jesus up, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. We ought to obey God rather than men. You killed him. Now see, there's a difference between someone who's out cowering, ashamed, or intimidated to come out, and someone who has come out. Now friends, you cannot judge someone harshly. You can't speak negative about someone who, is, who has come out. That's why I'm saying I'm learning. I'm learning a lesson by watching all of our society when they tell us you can't be judgmental, you can't be critical, you have to accept people when they come out and say or do or believe things contrary to what you believe, you can't say anything about them. 
what I'm, you know what, I'm just learning. I'm learning from society. That's why I said earlier, I'm coming out. I'm coming out of the closet. I'm coming out of the closet. And here's why I say that. I'm coming out of the closet when it comes to things like abortion. Friends, I'm for abortion. What? Oh, yeah, I'm for abortion. See, here's what I'm learning. I'm learning from society that we can change the definition of words to fit a meaning or to fit a, a scenario that we want. See? Now, most of you out there know that abortion means you're killing a child that's in the womb or, in some cases, you're killing a child that's even already born. Now, if we can redefine marriage, and we're told that we have to redefine marriage, and it has to be between two men, no matter what God says, no matter what the originator of marriage says, we have to accept this newfangled, improved definition of marriage is between two men or two women because, after all, we have to be tolerant and we have to love everybody. And so the state of Minnesota now recently uh, passed a law that says, you know what? Homosexuals get married. So if we can change the definition of marriage, then I'm going to change the definition of abortion. And so instead of calling the death penalty the death penalty, I'm just going to call it abortion. I'm going to call it abortion now. Because, see, here's what I find interesting. Most people who criticize, who criticize the death penalty and say, oh, you shouldn't kill people, you shouldn't kill people, they're the same people that turn around and go, it's a woman's right to choose to kill a baby. Well, okay, I'm, you know what? I, I can be pro-choice. I can be pro-choice. I choose, I choose abortion when it comes to mass murderers. How about that? Now, you can't say anything about me. You can't say anything negative about me because I'm coming out. See, I, I'm out of the closet. I'm out, you can't, no, don't call up and be all hateful and be judgmental and, and be truthophobic because, you know, I'm, I'm just coming out of the closet. I'm changing the definition. You have to accept my definitions. Otherwise, you're a bigot and you're a homophobe and you're a racist and you're all other kind of mean things. So you have to accept it. So we're just going to call abortion and, and we're going to make that fit the death penalty. See, because we live in a society where abortion is okay. Abortion is okay, so we'll just change the definition. We'll just modify the definition. And everybody has to accept that. See? So I'm, I'm going to make a push to get everybody who is, um, who, 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 to come out of the closet. All the people who love the truth come out of the closet. We're going to start, we're going to start calling uh, the death penalty. That's just abortion. You know, it's real, real late. It's like, what, 280th trimester abortion. I, I don't know what it is, you know. And here's why I say this. See, I don't know if you've been keeping up with the news, but here's this man. His name's Kermit Gosnell up in Philadelphia. He's an abortion doctor. And he, uh, he's been killing babies. They say, oh, no, you can't say uh, that's killing babies because it's abortion. It's not killing babies. Well, under his definition of abortion, he was actually killing babies that were already born. He's actually killing babies that were already born. They would, uh, they would take scissors and, and uh, snip their uh, uh, spinal column, or they would stab them, or, or stab them in the brain, back of the head, whatever, however they want to kill them. You know, it's all humane, I guess, by their definition. So they say, well, that's abortion. That's abortion. That's all under the guise of abortion. It doesn't matter if the baby came out of the womb and is alive. It's still abortion. Now, you may not know this, friends, but our president, when he was a senator, voted three times for a bill that said if a baby was born, as a result of an abortion, in other words, it's a failed abortion, and the baby was alive, you cannot give that baby medical attention. So, you see, even, even now we're changing the definition of abortion to include babies that were born alive. A failed abortions, now they're alive, and so we still kill them anyway. Well, that's all abortion. Well, I'm for abortion then. I'm for abortion, except what I'm for abortion, I'm for that abortion that would say, Let's kill guys like this. Kermit Gosnell. Let's put them to death. Now, talk about 
Talk about irony. Friends, do you realize that here's a man who kills babies under the name of abortion, and he determined that instead of going through the appeal process, which would take years and years and he'd probably die in prison, he just chose to, he just chose not to have the appealing process. He waived his appellate rights in exchange for life in prison if the district attorney would take the death penalty off the table. Now think about that. Think about that for a minute. A man who was killing babies, who was all pro-choice, now decides, you know what, I'm going to choose life. When it comes to him, he chooses life. He doesn't give the choice of life to his victims. The choice of life or death belongs to the mother or belongs to the doctor, but it doesn't belong to the baby. But when it comes to self-preservation, he chooses life. Well, you know what, friends? I think if, if, if he's pro-abortion, and I know he is, I'm pro-abortion too. I think, I think we should just kill him. I think he should be convicted and put to death. And someone said, well, that's harsh, James. Well, you know, friends, I'm coming out of the closet. So you can't, you can't, don't call up and say I'm wrong. Because I guarantee you, you're going to hear it from me. You're going to hear from me. You're wrong. You're a hate monger. I'm just going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. You call and disagree with me, you're, you're, you're full of hate. You can't disagree with me. I'm out. See, I'm coming out. I'm for abortion. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Here's what Paul says in Romans 3, Romans 13, Romans 13 and verse 3. Here's what Paul says. Paul said, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise the same. For he, talking about the government, the ruler, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he, the hear, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Now friends, if our government didn't have the definition of good and evil backwards, then we wouldn't really have to worry about the government because they would be punishing the evil. They would put guys like Kermit Gosnell to death. There wouldn't be any bargain about it. There wouldn't be any, any, any talk about it. But you know what? We have people on abortion row. This is not death row. It's abortion row. We're, uh, they're, they're waiting on, on death row who've been convicted and, but yet, instead of, well, maybe I said they're not on abortion row. Instead, they're giving, living out life in prison because our society says, well, we can't kill them. Let's see. Somebody who kills five or six people, ten people, twenty people, however many people, is convicted of that. We can't put them to death, but yet we can abort all these babies. Well, I'm for abortion. I think we should just kill them. We should put them to death, put the evil away from society. But what happens is these guys, they stay in prison, they get interviewed, they write books, they get all the fame and the publicity, and everybody talks about it. We know all their names. We know all their names. Well, maybe we should just have aborted them. Aborted them when they were 30 years old. Aborted their life when they were 50 years old. Aborted their life when they were convicted of the crime. See, I'm, I'm pro-abortion. I'm pro-abortion. I'm defining abortion as the death penalty. I'm all for the death penalty. So I'm in favor of aborting the lives of all those who commit these, these uh, deeds, these crimes, worthy of death. That's, that's what I'm in favor of. I'm in favor of that kind of abortion. All right? Now, let me tell you what else I'm coming out for. I, I'm, coming out, I'm coming out for the truth on salvation. Now, the reason I say that, friends, because a lot of people, a lot of people are afraid to come out. They're intimidated. 
Oh, if you come out and say the truth on something, you're going to get, you know, you're going to be in trouble. Well, if I come out of the closet on truth, if I come out of the closet and tell you something the Bible says, you can't say anything bad about me. See, I'm learning a lesson. I'm learning. I'm learning from the way, from the way people are, are treating me, and I'm just trying to put the shoe on another foot here. See, I'm all for the truth on what the Bible teaches on salvation. In Mark 16, 15, and 16, Mark uh, 16, verse 15, notice what the Bible says. Jesus said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now what's the result of preaching the gospel? What will happen if you preach the gospel? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now friends, there's, there's no other way to read this verse than to, and to come to the conclusion that Jesus said, He that believes, number one, and is baptized, number two, shall be saved, number three. You cannot reword this verse in any way, shape, or form and make it say, He that believes and is saved shall be baptized. It just doesn't work that way. If Jesus did not mean that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, if he didn't mean that, that salvation comes after baptism, then tell me how he, how he, what he meant. But see, I'm coming out. I'm coming out of the closet. I'm speaking the truth on this. See? And so you're going to have to accept me preaching this way because if not, then, then you must be a gospel of foe. Because Jesus said preach the gospel. And he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now in Acts 2 verse 38, Acts 2 verse 38, look what, look what he said. Listen to what he said. Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now where did he put remission of sins? Was it after repentance? No. Was it after repentance and baptism? Yes. Now, by the way, to all my friends who are truthophobias and don't love the truth and want to say, well, you're saved at the point of belief. Where's belief in this verse? Where's belief in this verse? Jesus said, Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That is, so that your sins will be forgiven. They go together. Now, friends, I'm not about to back down off. I'm, I'm so confident in that, I'm going to come out, and I'm going to put it right in your face and say, look, this is what the Bible teaches. You can't say anything about it. Because, see, I, I'm claiming the coming out clause. I'm claiming I'm coming out, so you, you, can't, you can't oppose that. In Acts 22, in verse 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, Now why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Friends, Jesus said, that baptism comes before the remission of sins. Saul of Tarsus was told to be baptized and wash away thy sins. Any way you slice it, the remission of sins, the washing away of sins, the forgiveness of sins always comes after baptism. That's just the way God, that's just the way God said it. So if someone comes along and tells me, well, you know, Water, water, baptism doesn't have any part in God's plan of salvation. You know what? I, I think they just, they just hate the truth. They're, they're haters. They're haters. Or, or maybe they're hydrophobies. Isn't that, isn't that what, a, what we're told? If you oppose homosexuality, you're a homophobe. If you oppose something else, you're, you're whatever kind of phobe. You're afraid of something. Well, you must be afraid of water. And I know, that's, I know that there's one Baptist preacher around that, that's that way, Mr. Ralph Laws. Listen to what he says. He likes giving these definitions. Let's see, if, let's see if he'll give this definition. Do I have Mr. it plugged Laws in right? Has a, has a, uh, uh, a love, a fondness 
for using the dictionary. Now I think I just played that. Did I just play that? Not going to heaven. I just played this. There will not be That's one not Baptist in heaven. Charles, would you take just a minute and flip right over here where that marker's at and read baptism. I want to show the public something right now. The act of baptizing, right, or sacrament of dipping a person into water or sprinkling water on him as a sign of washing away of sin and admission into the Christian church. Right. right. Now, That's let me ask I you this. Taught. According, according to theological and the biblical uh, or the uh, definition of baptism is the one who baptizes. That makes Johnny Robertson a Baptist, don't it? Right. Uh oh. Now, he liked the dictionary. So watch this. Mr. Law spent so much time trying to trying to get around being baptized. Even went so far to say Noah, not even one drop of water touched Noah. Therefore, I don't have to be baptized. Well, let's just go to the dictionary. Hydrophobic. Resistant to or avoiding wetting. Relating to or having a lack of affinity for water. By that definition, Mr. Laws has rabies. He's hydrophobic. See that? Now, sir, Mr. Laws, what I suggest is... You stay away from the dictionary and go back to the Bible. There you go. There you go. Hydrophobic. Afraid of water. Don't, they don't want to admit water is anywhere in God's plan. Friends, I didn't write the book. I just read it. I just preach it. And I'm coming out on the side of the truth about what the Bible says that you must do in order to be saved. Now, if you don't like that, then you, you are the hater here. So you're you're the one who's who's intolerant, you know. Y'all call in, y'all tell us all the time what we should and shouldn't do. Well, that's just because y'all are intolerant. John, intolerant. Uh, what about this? What about this coming out? Uh, I'm coming out for the church. I'm gonna come out on the side of the truth that there's one kind of church that Jesus built. Matthew 16, 18. Now remember, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm evoking the, the coming out clause here. So you're going to have to say, accept it. So you, 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 can't, you can't refute it because I'm playing the coming out clause. I'm not coming out of the clause that I'm coming out. I'm playing the coming out clause. Listen, Jesus said, Thou art Peter upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, uh, Matt, if you would, please. There, there may be somebody that you know, wants to take issue with that. I know, there, I know there's not any intolerant people out there. <clears throat> Jesus said, upon this, church, upon this rock I'll build my church. It belongs to Jesus. And it is singular. That is, there's one kind. One kind of church. Friends, the church that meets at 250 the Boulevard, and the church that meets at 820 uh, uh, Starling Avenue, and the church that meets at 120 American Legion, are all the same kinds of churches. Same kind of church. All right? Just different location. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Well, there's only one kind. There's only one kind. And I'm coming out of the closet to say that there's only one kind. Now, that church that Jesus built is his body. Oh, they, they lit up now. All right, listen, here we go. You're on the word from the Lord. Hey, James, how we doing? I'm doing great. I didn't have the slightest idea that you were such a vicious person and that you were doing these things. But uh, I was listening to it and really enjoyed it tonight. Uh, you know what got me? You were talking about the basketball player? Yes, sir. I don't keep up with none of that, but a friend of mine was telling me how the President of the United States made a personal call to this man to congratulate him on his coming out and how proud of him he was and so forth. The President of the United States of America, personal phone call, right. or something like that. And I totally agree with you about Dr. Gosnell. I'm a firm believer in capital punishment. If anybody should have ever received a death penalty, 
this man should have. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you came out of the closet on that. Say we're we're coming out. I'm, uh, what you're saying tonight, I stand right with you on everything. Just a you're saying. Well, just thought I'd let you know. All right. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank Appreciate you. It. You want to the Lord? Yes, um, about Chris coming out the closet and Kermit killing the babies. I just want to say that Perry um, Cotman has five point number statements here, and number one says, "Having been saved from past sins by an by an obedient faith in Christ and through the grace of God, the books of Romans, Mark, Acts, Ephesians, John, Revelation, and Acts again, others such as children are saved." But in point number five. He says, for in God's presence, there is fullness of joy and pleasures for evermore. So even if they do convict um, Kermit with the death penalty, it's going to be someone else out here that's going to penalize somebody else's child or their father's or mother's past. And in the book of Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. excuse me, Deuteronomy, chapter okay. 4, verse 2, it says, not add or subtract laws. What, so, uh, what, hang on a second. So I, 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 lost, I lost you there somewhere. So if, if, Kermit, if Kermit Gosnell mm-hmm. was, is convicted, if he was given the death penalty, what did you say? I missed that. There will be someone out here amongst others that would try to carry on what he did to somebody else's child due to their past sins. Okay, but does that make it right? Are you saying there's someone else that would carry on and do what he was doing? Right, because they're trying to make it a law. Right. And if, I'm saying, if they're going to make it a law, they need to fix it to where not just penalize the person that you hate, but set it for yourself. Because it's not right for a woman to go forth and say they, they should submit the, the abortion law, but then as soon as you get pregnant by somebody that you don't want to spend your life with, you first went in the clinic trying to get an abortion, taking yeah. the, um, the morning after pill. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That, that's hypocritical. Yeah. Well, I, and, I, and, what I'm, and what I would say is that's why you know, our society is broken down because we've gotten away from God's principles. And God's principles would always say, you know, one man and one woman for life. That's what God intended for marriage. And then the family unit, if you keep the family unit intact and the husband's doing what God says and the wife's doing what God says, then the children then are being brought up as God says. And it really stops a whole lot of the problems if we would just get back to the family unit as God stated in the beginning. And, for, you know, any anytime you deviate from that, it just gets worse and worse and worse on down the line to the point of, you know, when we talk about abortion, here's what I think people don't realize. When you're talking about abortion, people are saying it's okay to kill your own offspring. Right. Now, that is, that's, that's terrible. You know, even... It's so wrong, but it's also wrong for someone to step forward and try to penalize somebody that wants to have that child and actually have a family. You know what I mean? Because you're supposed to put God first. Right. And without God, uh, God's curses will well, fall how, apart. How, how would, how would so, someone be penalized if they wanted to have a family? Like, they would go through they would go through the extreme of custody battles, child support, child protective services. They would go through the, the, through everything okay. to stop right. you from having a holy, sanctified, Christified life. Okay, I see. Under the holy matrimony right. of true marriage. All right, I see. Okay. Well, yeah, and again, it all gets down to a breakdown of the family and getting away from God's from God's rules for for the family and for the home. Would you agree? Yes, and that's why we okay. have churches. But then it goes back again. If you don't, if you're not in the right membership of the right church, then you can't say you have a family. So right. that leaves you out here to the world and the worldly favors. And then, and then again, there you go again, sinning again. So it's like a cycle that's continuing that needs to come to. Well, a, but you can't do that because you got people adding and subtracting laws when you already have ten. Well, commands. that's right. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It all it all gets down to people getting away from what God said and trying to add their own rules and. And so forth to it. That's right. Listen, I appreciate your call. I'm, I'm running out of time, but I, w- I want to try to get one more call in, okay? All right. Thanks, Th- thanks for your call. You're on the word from the Lord. You're on the word from the Lord. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm watching your show. And I see you're talking about uh, coming out and homosexuality. I just want to know why... Why are Christians so concerned about someone else's sexuality? 
mean, well, our, I just because let we're them con- live their life. Because we're concerned about what God says. Yeah, I understand that, but when it, when it comes to, let's just talk about the law. I mean, we live in America where everybody should have the, the right to be free and live as they choose. So if a man and a man wants to marry each other or a female and a female wants to marry each other, just let them go ahead and do it because, I mean, in the afterlife, um, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Well, if that's the case, then why do we? Why are we concerned about anything? Would you? No, would you I say? Mean, it's, not, it's not that we're concerned about anything. It's just that in, in America, I mean, America is not built on religion. I mean, there's just not constitution that Congress shall establish no religion. So why should we? Well, we're not. We're not trying to establish religion, but the, but the, but the country was founded on a principle that there is a creator. That grants us the that grants us certain rights, and gives you know gives us the liberty and the freedom to choice and that that sort of thing, you know the, the creator certainly mentioned in the in the founding fathers or the founding documents of our country, but what I'm saying, sir, is I mean you're saying why are we worried about someone's sexuality? Well, if that's the, why are we worried about anything? Are you concerned if someone is a murderer? Alright, sir. You're 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 I, branching off into into something else. I mean, no, I'm I'm saying what are you what are you concerned about in society? Are you concerned? Are, I mean, anybody are, can be a murderer. But are you concerned I mean, about anything in society? Well, are you concerned about what anybody does in society? Is there any concerns you have about what people do? Yes, there is concerns about what people do. I mean, it can, it can go towards these uh, these gun laws with people being able to buy any kind of firearm they want without any sort of background check or any sort of registration. That's something I'm very concerned about. Sir, I don't know. I don't know when the last time if you've ever bought a gun, but there are plenty of background checks. There are tons of sir, background I mean, checks. The problem is not, on laws. The laws aren't enforced. But I don't know. You talked to me about going to another place, I mean, you're more concerned about whether someone can buy a gun than you are if someone is living an immoral life. Is that right? I mean, but who's to say that being a homosexual is an immoral life? I well, mean, do you made? believe the Bible, sir? Yes, I do. Then, well, so if the Bible says that homosexuality is immoral, are you going to be concerned about that? But the thing is this, I mean, is there an ultimate sin? I mean, there, there's people that say that homosexuality is the, the ultimate sin. I mean, so is someone being homosexual... Well, I don't know that I'd say it's the ultimate sin, murder. but I wouldn't say it's the ultimate sin, sir, but I would say it's it's sin, and it is open rebellion against God. Now, are are we are we not supposed to be concerned about that? Well, it's another thing. I mean, when we're born, everyone is born in sin. No, we're not. Right? No. We're not? See, that, 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 that right there is a problem that I think okay. perpetuates th- this problem of, well, why can we... People say, well, we shouldn't condemn these people because we're all born in sin. Well, that's, that's, that's incorrect. The Bible doesn't say we're born in sin. But if you believe that, if a person is taught that and believes that, then anything they do, you know, it's it's uh, it's just it's just the way God made them. So why would we condemn someone who's a homosexual if God made them that way? And that's why I deny that we're born in sin. No, people aren't born homosexuals they're, any more than they're born killers or they're born uh, adulterers or fornicators. And and that and that's why we're concerned about it because when you take away. The, found, the, the principles of morality that God put in his word, when you take those away from the society, then ultimately anything goes. And what we're, what we're seeing is we're seeing people moving further and further away from God's foundation, moral foundation, and the result is we're getting more and more people who are not concerned about life. Like we just talked about abortion. I mean, if, if anything goes... If we're not worried about anything in society because we're born in sin, then why would we 
why would we even worry about anything at all? Let's just get rid of the book and go home. Who, who told you you were born in sin? Well, no one told me that I was born in sin. It's just something that, I, that I've heard as, uh, as I've been growing up. Well, well, so somebody, so somebody told it to you. Somebody, somebody told you that, or you you heard it growing up. So someone told you that, and I'm just saying, you know, you didn't hear it from the Bible. Someone told you that, or maybe someone told you the Bible said it. And what we're saying is, let's get back to the Bible. Let's find out exactly what God said, you know, and come out on the side of truth. That's what that's that's my whole point. I'm coming out on the side of truth. And I'm saying if we get back to truth, then ultimately we'd have a better society because we'd all be, you know, we, we wouldn't be condemning the truth tellers. We'd be condemning those that speak contrary to the truth. Listen, sir, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to you some more, but I got, I've got uh, about a minute and a half left, so I need to wrap up. Sure. All right, thanks for your call. All right. All right. Well, friends, so come down to truth, you know. The one church... One church, if you think that any church will do, then I'm just going to say you're a, 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 a ecclesiophobe. You know, you're, you're afraid of the church. You're afraid of the church. Uh, but here's my plea. Here's my plea. I'll make this plea in the, in, the, in the last minute that I have here. Friends, I know there's members of the church. I'm talking right to the members of the Church of Christ now. There are members of the church who are afraid to come out. But you know what happens? Friends, we want to make such a bold stand and come out that it encourages you to have some backbone and come out in defense of the truth. Look at this. In 1 Samuel 14, you can go back and read this, but Jonathan and his armor bearer decided that they two alone were going to go out and fight the Philistines. And the Bible says that it, it caused such a great ruckus. It shook the earth. And the Bible says that after it's all said and done, likewise all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. Friends, I want to convince you of this. If you will come out and stand for the truth, come out and, and stand for what is what you really believe in, then you can say like everybody else, look, I'm just coming out. I'm, 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 I'm telling you the truth. You know, you can't judge me. I'm coming out. I'm going to use the same arguments that they make against us to defend the truth. Friends, thanks for watching. Hope it helps. Always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? If we can help you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Let us know how we can assist you. Remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. Sunday. You may have some big plans to do something this weekend. Will you need an umbrella or will you be okay? We'll find out. We've got a lot of news from all across the region, including Rockingham County and Southside Virginia, including a story coming out of Henry County. I'll have that for you in just a few moments. But right now, let's go ahead and take a look at news that's happening right here at home. The company installing the almost 103-year-old Confederate monument in Reedsville's Greenview Cemetery said the first phase of the project is complete and they will return sometime soon to install the new soldier at the top. A representative with Parker Monuments said they would be finished with the installation of the large pieces of the granite marker by nightfall on Wednesday. That was so. He also said the next time they return will be to install the new soldier, which will stand at the top. Now, the soldier is being carved at present, but the representative from Parker Monuments could not say when it would be ready for placement atop the historical marker. And we'll show you those pictures again there. There you can see some of the video of that there as it's uh, there in Greenview Cemetery. Now, the monument we're talking about stood for 101 years at the intersection of South Scales and Moorhead Streets in downtown Reedsville. That was until the morning of May 23, 2011. The granite and marble monument was damaged when a Greensboro man accidentally slammed into the monument with his van, damaging parts of the lower monument 
and destroying the soldier that stood at the top. Within a few months, city employees dismantled and removed the monument from its original resting place and stored it at Reedsville's Public Works facility on Vance Street. A local group called HPAC, or the Historical Preservation Action Committee, has been working to restore the monument to downtown Reedsville, where it stood for over a century. Now, according to RockinghamNow.com, HPAC member Diane Parnell said the organization would decline comment until a court case involving the monument is ruled on. So there you see it as it stands on Montgomery Street in Reedsville. The Confederate monument, which stood in downtown Reedsville for over 100 years, is now standing in Greenview Cemetery. We will keep you updated on all the latest developments, including the soldier when it arrives and to be placed on top of that uh, historic marker, and we'll do that here on Star News. So please stay.